Hey everybody, Andrew here. The episode you're about to hear was recorded in early February of 2019, well before travel restrictions, social distancing, and flattening the curve became a reality and began changing how we backpack and enjoy the outdoors in 2020. So keep that in mind as you listen. You'll hear us talk about trips and plans that we didn't end up taking. Thanks, and enjoy the episode. Hey everybody, welcome to the Backpacking Light Podcast. Today's episode is about load hauling, how to go light when you have a whole bunch of gear. Look for me in the mountains where walking has a way of pulling you to your peace of mind. Hey everybody, my name is Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And we'll be your host today as we talk about, as Ryan said, going light when you have a whole lot of gear to carry. But first, Ryan, I've been noticing you've been putting a bunch of awesome Bill Nye experiments on the uh, on the Instagram and the Facebook posts. What have you been up to in your labs there? Yeah, so uh, just trying to collect some quantitative data to not only to feed into gear testing, but to kind of study some processes. And so three major projects I have going on right now is we're, and we've been involved in this one for quite some time. We're looking at load testing on tent guy lines. So we set up a tent out in the field. We have some load sensors attached to the guy lines, and then they come into a data logger and a computer. And we're looking at how wind loading affects the loading on guy lines, and then in turn, how that dynamic loading affects the failure of tent stakes. So that that's one of the big things we're doing right now. Now, does it seem like this is one of those things that's that's like uh, where you hear a study where it says like ducks are good swimmers, and everyone's like, duh. Um, is is this one of those things where it's like, duh, you should have your guy lines tight, or are you trying to get to something else here? Well, the, the biggest thing we see with inexperienced hikers, especially with ultralight shelters is yes, that's it. Their guy lines usually aren't tight enough for withstanding a storm that has high winds. So part of this study is to develop the instructional basis, so to speak, for justifying why you need to have very tight guy lines in order to withstand strong winds with ultralight shelters. The second piece of it though is more nuanced. And so we're trying to figure out what causes a stake to fail. And in order to get a feel for that, we're really trying to look at the dynamic loading of uh, wind on tent stakes. And it's it's that constant cyclic wiggling of a tent stake that ultimately causes its failure. It's never like, one gust just blows it all out. And so the the overall goal of this is to study how wind affects tent stakes in various soils. Got it. Okay, what else do you have going on? And then I'm looking at how moisture is transported in various layering systems. And this project came about because of our recent emphasis in active insulation, you know, these insulating garments that are super breathable. And so we're looking at how those garments compare to a traditional insulating garment at allowing moisture to escape your clothing system. And so one of the tests I've been doing is going on a a hike or a run with a completely saturated base layer and then whatever layer I want to put on top of that, like some type of insulating layer. And then I will monitor the moisture content in that layer over the course of the activity and use that to compare how a traditional insulating layer performs relative to an active insulating layer. Okay, cool. And you're you're looking at a bunch of different base layers in this process too, right? Yeah, I've been focusing primarily on my go-to base layer, which is merino wool, but we, we're also looking at some alpaca layers and uh, the Bernier mesh uh, fishnet layers. So looking at base layers is one question, uh, but for now, while I'm looking at insulation pieces, I'm focusing on just keeping the base layer constant. Okay. And then you're also peering through a microscope right now, right? Right. Especially now that we've got some alpaca layers in, and these have been really impressive because they are the first alpaca wool layers I've found that are very, very light. The 
the weight of the wool fabric is about 115 gram per square meter. And so it's it's one of the lightest natural fiber base layers I've had the chance to use. And so you're looking at a long sleeve crew neck shirt that weighs less than five ounces, which is pretty dang light for wool. Mm -hmm. So I've been specifically looking at the difference in moisture transport between alpaca and merino, and then comparing that to things like polypropylene and polyester, you know, the, the typical synthetics that we use. And so, yeah, I have a, a microscope that can see down to like, I don't know, 220 times magnification. And so being able to like put a drop of water in there and watch it disperse through the layer and absorb into the fibers is, is really kind of fascinating and telling. And, and it gives you some insight into how all these different fibers perform. Awesome. Sounds cool. I can't wait to see all the results of all this. Yeah. And I hope to be able to provide some actual quantitative data that actually says, okay, this particular fiber or fabric is performing better or worse than this particular fiber or fabric. And so with the microscope, it's kind of cool because you can, you can take live video with it and then measure the rate of wicking and things like this. So yeah, we'll see what comes out of it. Awesome. How about you? What are you up to these days? I am just days away now from leaving for my through hike of the Benton McKay Trail. Uh, I've got all my logistics planned out. I'm about to ship out my my one resupply. And I'm particularly excited because I'm going to be using this 300 miles as a chance to test a new pack from Rogue Panda Designs. Now, these guys have been making bike packs for a while. Uh, various frame bags and things like that. This is their first backpack. Um, I'm going to try the 65 liter version. It's got twin aluminum stays. It's got a half frame sheet. It doesn't have a lumbar pad. They've attached the hip belt at the base of the stays. Uh, It's waterproof X-Pack construction with a roll top, and it's designed to be waterproof. Um, it's, it's kind of a cool, cool little design. It's not super revolutionary, but there's a couple of little things here and there that I'm really intrigued by, and I'm excited about getting it on my back. So how is a 300-mile through hike, right? And you're doing it with mm-hmm. one resupply. So how many days are you hiking between resupply? Uh, I'm, my first stretch is six days, and then my second stretch is seven days. Sounds good. And then what kind of pack weight are you looking at uh, maximum? I'm still dialing in my food, but the the Zorro is rated for 40 pounds comfort, and I really want to test its its weight and load hauling capacity. So I'm I'm I might actually intentionally try to get up to 35 or 40 pounds. I might that might be a good excuse to bring my chair. So we'll see. Sounds great. Um, but this is actually a good way to segue into what we're talking about today, which is. Uh, trips where you may have to do some load hauling. So there's a couple of things that spring to mind here. Um, sometimes it could be like an expedition style trip with multiple weeks between resupply. It could be something in the winter where you have to have a lot of heavy clothes. Uh, it could even be like in your in the desert with long water carries. There's a couple of different reasons that you'd have to strap some more weight on your back than you might be used to. So we thought it would be cool to dig into that idea a little bit and talk about some of the gear and skills that you might need for this type of trip. So let's start with gear. Um, We're just talking about packs, and it seems to me that on this type of trip where you're loading up, pack choice, which is already very important, kind of shoots to the top of the list in terms of importance. So what are some features, some design features, some considerations that we might be looking for when we look for a a quote unquote load hauler type of pack? I think one of the biggest ones is volume because you're looking at the need to pack in, for example, several days of food or even a couple of weeks of food or uh, a common scenario is pack rafting. And so now you've got a, a pack raft, a PFD, you might have a throw bag or a mountaineering trip where you're carrying ropes and glacier gear and things like that. And so for me, the challenge has always been trying to fit all this stuff into a big enough pack bag because I like little packs. They feel better and they look, they, they, you know, when you're trying to bushwhack or scramble, they just, it's, they're easier to manage, but it's much more difficult to hike with a pack that has tons of stuff strapped to the outside than it is to be able to contain everything inside. So that's always kind of number one for me. 
And then number two is it's got to be comfortable at a heavy weight. And for me, the the additional weight of a an internal frame and a decently wide hip belt is worth its weight in gold because the ability to distribute that weight on your hips is so important. And then the frame being able to adjust the weight that's being borne by the shoulders versus the hips uh, just goes a long way to uh, being comfortable over long days. So you're looking for weight transfer over say extra padding in the shoulder straps. Yeah. The shoulder straps are a little bit less meaningful for me because if I carry a 20 pound ultralight backpack, I can carry that on my shoulders. But if I carry a 50 pound backpack, I may still only want 20 pounds on my shoulders. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I, the shoulder straps to me are, are like a tertiary piece of this system that aren't as important. So what's your favorite load hauling pack right now? Right now I have a McHale expedition size pack and it's a Sark at and it has about 80 liters, 80 to 90 liters of volume. And so that's what I'm using for long trips or trips where I absolutely need to carry more than about 40 or 45 pounds. And just for some comparison, how much does that pack weigh versus maybe one of your more ultralight packs? Well, mine is a full spectra pack. So it's it's made with a pretty durable, heavier fabric. And it comes in for the main pack bag at just under four pounds. And then I have some accessories like top pockets and outside pockets that I can add to that that add a few more ounces. So what about footwear? Um, if I know my pack is going to be heavy, how might that affect my choice of footwear and why? Once you add pack weight, you limit your ability to be nimble and adjust to rougher terrain. So there is a theoretical argument at least to move towards footwear that provides you with more oh, resistance to torque when you're walking, more stability, sometimes people will call it. And so um, a footwear that is is higher in the ankle is, an, uh, is often considered critical when carrying a heavy pack. That's really not what I look for. I look for footwear that prevents my the sole of my foot from shifting on the footbed of the shoe from side to side, because now I've added, you know, tens of pounds of pack weight. And let's say I'm traversing a steep slope. And you can imagine that if you're flat footed on that slope, your feet are, they have a tendency to slide over the shoes footbed. And so with a heavy pack, I look for shoes that have a stiffer upper um, I tend to lean more towards a leather low top shoe. My footwear of choice when carrying a heavy pack is something like a Scarpa Zen Pro or something like that. Full leather upper, uh, nice stiff footbed, and just gives me a lot of side to side stability, especially if I'm scrambling or anything like that. Is that an approach shoe or is that a trail runner? I would say it's a it's definitely an approach shoe. Um, running in a in a shoe like this that's just in mm -hmm. general stiffer is kind of a miserable mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Are there any other gear considerations that we should be thinking about if we know we're going to be in for a trip like this? As my pack weight goes up, I tend to uh, rely more on trekking poles for the same reason. Uh, you with a heavy pack, you tend to go off balance more, and trekking poles can help catch you before your body has to catch that uh, extra pack weight and you know, it might cause you to tweak a muscle or an ankle or something like that. If I'm looking at my pack weight and I'm looking at my spreadsheet and I'm like, holy moly, you know, I've got to, I've got to shave some ounces here. And I know I can't get rid of the food or the water or the specialized gear that's making this trip possible. What's the biggest thing I can do to lighten up my pack? Well, I think the biggest thing you can do is to make make yourself think that you're carrying a lighter pack. And so my recommendation is to do more squats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there, there, there's some compelling motivations to really be careful with your gear. Because ideally, if you're carrying a big pack, you want the majority of that pack weight to be food that you're going to consume through your trip. And then it becomes easier to carry. But if you just can't get around that and you're going to end up carrying heavy gear like a pack rafting kit or a mountaineering kit, uh, 
you've, you've got to adapt your body. And I think some strength training and endurance training are, are critical components of that. Well, this is a good lead in to talking about the skills that we could use to improve uh, trips like this. So what's an example of a skill I could use on a trip that involves load hauling that might help me shave a couple ounces or maybe even a pound or so off my pack weight? There's a photographer up in Montana named Tom Murphy, and he he's one of the most famous Yellowstone wildlife photographers in the world. And his strategy is not to skimp on the quality of his camera equipment, but this creates um, an, an enormous weight burden when he goes backpacking in the Yellowstone wilderness. And so his strategy is lighten up everything else. And he'll even take a tarp camping in Yellowstone in the middle of winter in order to uh, keep his pack weight down so that he can take the core of what he really wants to do, which is uh, heavy camera gear. So just being comfortable with ultralight camping gear can go a long ways at allowing you to carry extra weight with a larger pack uh, full of the gear you want to take. Yeah, that tarp example is interesting to me because um, I know personally that's an area of ultralight that I haven't explored yet. Partly that's because the places that I have done most of my backpacking are very bug prone. And so it's just never seemed like a good idea for me. But um, just for the sake of argument, if I wanted to learn how to use a tarp, how would I start going about doing that? I think... The most important thing is there's a psychological barrier to get through. And there's just something about um, sleeping in a shelter that does not have walls that tends to be unsettling to people. And so uh, getting some experience in a low consequence environment where you don't have high winds or cold temperatures or bugs to deal with is really critical to get you used to the idea that you're sleeping in a shelter without walls. So you might start in your backyard. You might go to a local state park and, and front country camp. Uh, and then you might transfer all this to the back country. And then as you get more and more experience and, and just comfort being in that type of shelter, then you can add more inclement environments, like try it once during bug season and take a head net or, or one of these little pop-up net tents that you can put over your sleeping bag and just kind of get used to the whole idea that, okay, I can deal with um, inclement conditions, but here's what I got to do to be comfortable in those conditions. Same with wind. You know, if a lot of tarp campers will use a bivy sack and uh, even a light, non-waterproof, highly breathable bivy sack that might weigh you know, four to seven ounces as a way to keep wind and bugs and rain spray and whatnot off them so that they can continue using an ultralight tarp. Yeah, that psychological barrier uh, cracks me up because I, I think about that a lot, like like the millimeters of, like the microscopic amount of sil nylon between me and the elements is really doing much to protect me, but it feels like it is. Well, it 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 is protecting you from wet and wind, right? So sure, that, sure, those sure. are two of the big ones. Um, and then in terms of bugs, being inside a fully enclosed tent does give you protection from bugs. And if you're, if you're like in Southeast Yellowstone or up in Alaska, someplace where it has legendary mosquito populations, um, that's a big deal, you know, and it does take some intention and practice to deal with conditions like that when you're tarp camping. Awesome. Well, we will be talking more about load hauling and some of the gear that goes into that when we get to our interview later in the episode. But for now, let's talk about what is new at BPL. Sounds good. I think one of the big ones that you and I have been working on specifically is really kind of dialing in the format for our reviews so that we're appropriately communicating to our readership uh, the types of reviews we do and and the differences between them. So we've kind of we've kind of been all over the map on this the last yeah. 20, 20 years, and so we've we've produced everything from first looks reviews uh, to flash reviews to kind of these news stories from outdoor retailer of gear that we haven't even used yet. 
all the way into these really detailed quantitative performance reviews. And those those detailed reviews, that's the bread and butter of what we've always done. And so we're we're not um, getting rid of those by any means. And I think a lot of the work you and I've done over the past few months has really focused on making sure our performance reviews are based on well-researched data, um, a lot of field testing, field testing in diverse environments, and maybe even some quantitative uh, performance testing done in the lab or maybe even in the field. But the the thing we're really trying to dial in now is how do we produce a a review that's that doesn't have that comprehensive field testing component. So maybe we have ten days of field testing on a product in in a limited environment or one season, you know, something like that. And so we're we're trying to shorten those up and tighten them up so that readers can read those, still get a ton of value out of them, and uh, not bombard them with everything that we have in a performance review. Yeah, and it's it's a hard adjustment to make, I think, for our writers because um, we we like to to nerd out on the details and get off on side tracks and tangents about fabrics and you know metrics and the science behind it, but um, we just don't have the the ability to produce that kind of writing with every piece of gear that comes across our desk. Yeah, for sure. And I I noticed when we were going through this proof of concept with you, you gave me this 3,500 word review and then told me this is a limited review. This is what we're calling it for now, <laughs> yeah. limited review. And yeah. so my challenge that I gave myself was, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to edit this down to 1500 words and distill it into the absolute essence of what Andrew's experience with this particular product was. And I think we were pretty successful and I'm really excited about the new format. So let's move on to talk about the Wilderness Trekking Program. So we mentioned this in the last episode, um, but what I want to get into here is how this year's program is going to be different from what we've done in the past. The main thing is we're running all the trips at the same time. And we've experimented with this in the past. We've done two trips at the same time. But now we're running the whole program uh, during the same week of the year in July. And part of our motivation was we wanted to do it during a better weather season because the the bear tooths up in Montana are notoriously uh, challenging by the time Labor Day rolls around. uh, All bets are off. We've had everything from 70 mile an hour winds to deep snow to needing snowshoes and and horrendous rains and and we really wanted to be able to focus on the route this time. And so moving the whitetail trek, which has historically been a fall trek into the summer months, gives us the chance to say, okay, we have way more route options open to us now because we don't have to deal, deal with deep snow. So that's one major change. Second is that we've got all three treks going out at once. And that means we can bring everybody, all participants together, all the guides together in one spot and do some common training with everybody. And I'm excited because it has the chance to take, you know, instead of six or eight people, a couple of dozen people, or maybe even 30 people and bring them all together in a group environment where we can interact more and learn more from each other. So I'm really excited for that dynamic. One of the things about the whitetail trek is that in the past, you have taken that opportunity of unpredictability and horrendous weather as a way to teach people how to deal with those circumstances. So I'm wondering if, if by moving it into the earlier months, how do you preserve the level of intensity that that trip has traditionally had? Well, keep in mind, this is still an off-trail trip. So uh, we'll have a different type of off-trail travel in the early season because there will be more snow on the ground. That actually could open up more opportunities about where we could go. Uh, we might have to take, you know, ice axes and and spikes with us, but um, it will it will provide a new opportunity to try something new. Where in the fall, by the time September rolls around, most of the summer snows have melted, and some of the off trail travel can be horrendous because you're dealing with scree and talus on steep slopes, and that has actually caused us to. Um, be very, very careful about the routes we chose. So 
for me, uh, with my experience in the Bear Tooth, July opens up a lot more off trail route finding. And that's that's the part I really want to emphasize with the Whitetail Trek. Awesome. So let's finish up this segment by talking about some of the recent articles that we've published. What has particularly caught your eye? Well, speaking of uh, nerding out on things, Roger Caffin has uh, posted a couple of really interesting articles. Um, One is measuring waterproofness and outdoor performance fabrics using a hydrostatic pressure test device that he built himself. And he goes into the details of how he built it and and um, the test results on a couple of dozen different fabrics that he's tested and kind of goes through the methodology and explains some background about the fabrics and a very educational test because uh, we often assume that all fabrics are always waterproof, at least coated or laminated ones. And and he uh, tells us otherwise with some examples, and it's really interesting. The other one he did recently is answering the question about whether or not a heat exchanger attached to the bottom of a cooking pot is worth the wait. And he did this with his um, own test rig that he's, again, built at home to monitor the uh, efficiency of a stove system. So that's a really good article. And a heat exchanger, just just to clarify, this is where you're taking heat that the stove is producing and running it back down to the fuel canister, which becomes colder as it is in use and thus thus less efficient, right? That's what that's, we're talking about. That's, that's right. And so he was able to take a the exact same pot, one of them with a heat exchanger, one without, and get a pretty precise answer to this particular question. So it turned out great. And then the the other two articles I wanted to highlight are two apparel reviews, and they reflect our new review format. The first one was the Arcteryx Proton LT hoodie review that you and I wrote, and that is an example of our comprehensive performance review format. And then uh, a little bit more recent than that, we did the Enlightened Equipment VISP rain jacket review, and that's our new limited review format. And so that's kind of the, the short and sweet uh, review that's uh, based on uh, enough field testing to really get a feel for a product, but obviously not enough to put it through its paces in all conditions over the long term. Well, let's touch base with what the BPL community is talking about. What are some forum threads in the community that have caught your eye? Yeah, so the first one, I, I like I said before, I posted a graph of dynamic wind loading on a on a tent guy line and it was an interesting experiment because what i did was um, i tensioned a guy line to about five pounds and then um, subjected the tent to a 15 mile an hour wind and then measured the forces that uh, occurred on that guy line and so what i got was a tent that was incredibly flappy because it has not been tensioned well and these massive amount of forces that were delivered to the tent stake that eventually wiggled its way out of place. Then I took the same tent, tensioned the guy line to about 20 pounds, which is really quite tight for an ultralight tent, subjected it to the same 15 mile an hour wind and the stake never pulled out. And so the, the overall forces were pretty similar. They're about you know, and they might've added another five to eight pounds of force on the guy line, but that tent guy line that was staked out to a 20 pound force, uh, resulted in a tent stake that held. And so I posted this graph. And so now the community has been uh, responding and discussing, you know, why tents fail in the wind. And it's been a really fascinating conversation. There's about a hundred forum posts on there. And then another forum thread, which I've really enjoyed, is talking about uh, cold weather mattress systems. And so it's very common in the winter, especially those of us who use inflatable sleeping pads, to also bring a closed cell sleeping pad. And so there's a discussion on our forums about which, how should you layer these pads? And it's common to put a closed cell foam pad directly on the snow and then your air mattress on top of that pad. But there is some discussion about 
uh, the benefits of reversing that and putting the closed cell phone pad on top of the air pad. And then the community is kind of discussing the pros and cons to that. That's super interesting. I've never even considered flipping the two. What would what would the pro be to that? I think one of the pros, I've, I've tried this and I like the comfort level because what happens when you put the closed cell phone pad on top is you end up with a bed that's not quite so wiggly and it just feels more stable and comfortable. And I think it's because instead of the sharp parts of your body, like your shoulders and hips poking down into the air pad, uh, it's, it's more supported by that foam pad on top. Now there's some disadvantages to it as well, because now your air pad is on the ground directly. And so it may be more subject to the sharp things poking into it from the ground that might puncture it or something like that. And then having an air pad on snow directly can create some cold air currents inside the pad that might make you sleep less comfortable. Got it. And then the the third one is about a new tent that REI has come out with called the Flash Air One. And it's a solo tent that weighs 20 ounces. And this is probably one of the neater designs from a mass market manufacturer that is actually now in the realm of ultralight and worth serious consideration by an ultralight backpacker. And so our community is talking about the pros and cons of that. And the response has generally been pretty positive. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the shelter right now. It, it's uh, the design will certainly be uh, at least somewhat familiar to anyone who's been looking at ultralight tents for the last few years. But this looks like a shelter we need to get somebody to review really quickly. Yeah, it's kind of reminiscent of a tarp tent style design that uses trekking poles for setup and it's got a nice vestibule in it and it's side entry and yeah, again, 20 ounces, hard to beat. Okay, well, let's move on. Before we get to the interview, I want to talk about our new favorite things and and I'll go ahead and get started. I have been testing Zero Shoes Mesa Trail, which is their new trail runner that just came out. So if you're familiar with Zero Shoes, their trail runner for the last several years has been the Terraflex. Um, and the Terraflex is 9.9 ounces for each shoe. The Mesa Trail is 8.5 ounces for each shoe. And that's that's with me having waited after just come back from a run. So I think it's probably got some some moisture in there too. Um, it's, it's a fairly lightly built shoe. Uh, it's got a really thin mesh, um, but it still has a, a relatively wide toe box, not as wide as something like a, an Ultra. But... It has an aggressive tread, and I'm kind of excited about it. Um, my big thing is I want to see how long it's going to last. I, we've talked about this a lot. I really want to see if this shoe is going to hold up more than 300 miles. Yeah, that's always been my gripe with ultralight footwear is durability and the tread. So it's nice to see that you're putting aggressive soles on ultralight shoes now. I used to have a pair of Innovates that were a fell running shoe that had these gigantic lugs on the bottom. And I, I just loved them. They weighed about seven ounces a pair. Uh, I don't think they make them anymore, but um, I was fascinated by the performance of a shoe that was that light, but still had um, a mud worthy sole on the bottom of it. Yeah. I've been running in spikes for the last few months and just in the last week or so, I've been able to take the spikes off, but there's still a fairly good amount of compacted snow and ice out there on my trails and uh, the Mesa Trails so far is handling it like a champ. That's great news. Good niche. So what do you have going on right now? So we, you and I just wrote the Arcteryx Proton LT review, and now I'm testing the Proton FL hoodie, which takes a little bit different approach to active insulation. It has a similar breathable, highly breathable shell fabric on the outside of it, and then kind of this this uh, insulation on the inside that it's synthetic. It has a brushed surface on one side and then this uh, kind of uh, knitted mesh on the other. And that means you don't have to have a lining fabric. And it reminds me of the old Marmot dry climb construction where you had this uh, Trico mesh lining and then a Pertex outer shell. And I've really been loving it because it is probably the most breathable insulating jacket I've ever worn for cool conditions. And so, like I said before, when I was talking about testing, I've been 
wearing a saturated base layer and then going out on a hike or a run and then monitoring how much moisture moves through this jacket. And it's, it's an enormous amount of moisture, especially when you compare it to something like a traditional um, insulating layer, like a Patagonia Micropuff or something like that. So um, this jacket has allowed me to be very comfortable in the cold Wyoming winter wind at very high levels of exertion. So very impressed with it so far. Is this kind of in the same niche as the Patagonia Nano Air Light? I, I think it is, except the Nano Air Light does have a lining fabric. So it has synthetic high loft insulation sandwiched between two face fabrics. And so this jacket, the Arcteryx Proton FL, discards the lining fabric. So you basically just have outer fabric and then an inside insulation. All right. Well, now we're going to get to our interview. For this episode, I interviewed Kevin Tim, who is the owner and founder of Seek Outside. As you'll hear in the interview, Kevin is an avid hunter and originally set out to make gear that catered to hunters. But lately, he's been taking the design elements that appeal to hunters, like load hauling, and applying it to lightweight recreational backpacking gear. So in our interview, we talk about Seek Outside's load hauling packs, the Uniweep and Divide, plus the new, more traditionally designed internal frame pack, the Flight One. By the way, we have all three of those packs out to reviewers, so be looking out for those reviews shortly. Uh, Seek Outside also has a zipperless Dyneema tent, one-person shelter. And we also talk about their gear designing philosophy, being a small business owner in the outdoor industry, the overlap between hunters and recreational backpackers. And then at the end of the interview, we get into conservation and public lands use. It was a really fun conversation, and I think you'll enjoy it. So without further ado, here's the interview. Kevin Tim is the owner and founder of Seek Outside, and he makes tents and backpacks and stoves and all kinds of interesting things. And he's here today to talk to us about starting his company and some of the cool gear that they have. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us on the Backpacking Light podcast. Thank you for having me. I don't really know much about Seek Outside. Can you just kind of just tell me a little bit about the company and how it started and kind of what your journey's been like? Yeah, we started in 2009, 2010, somewhere in, in that um, time frame. Um, we primarily started uh, because of an idea I had uh, while I was snowshoeing in the winter. Um, and it's relatively kind of funny story. I came home, told my wife I had this great idea. Um, and I don't want to say it was a great idea, but at the time, the idea was more around um, hunting. Um, so for late season hunting tent, right? Um, and also at the time, you know, there were some other things available that were similar, but I didn't know at the time. I, I wouldn't have say I considered myself a gearhead, although I did do quite a bit of trail running, long distance um, day trips. Uh, I did a fair amount of peak bagging, some backpacking as well. Did some backpacking with the family, primarily backpacked when I hunted, right? Um, mm -hmm. But <clears throat> so I had this idea for a, for a teepee style tent made out of a lightweight material and kind of to back up a little bit i was familiar with some of the brands in the more backpacking lightweight backpacking world like i was familiar with tarp tent because i had some friends that had tarp tents mm -hmm. that, that i would um peak bag with and stuff like that um so that was kind of my familiarity level so i came home told my wife um my great idea and she basically told me it was the stupidest thing she ever heard <laughs> uh, so um i said come on because we had backpacked as a family and stuff and when you have two younger children you know in that five to ten and under range our kids were three years apart and you're backpacking into high mountain lakes for a weekend um uh, the adults end up really carrying a lot of weight right mm -hmm. um so i kind of i kind of sold her on that idea that we could use it like that and stuff. And so I finally convinced her, she knew how to sew a little bit. I finally convinced her to sew up a prototype and the prototype came up awful. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And she was like, see, I told you it was a retarded idea. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, don't throw the baby out with bathwater. I, I miscalculated something on this cut. 
and stuff. And so we made the next pro. I made a couple small models, right? And then the next prototype came out really good, actually. And within a couple months, maybe two, four months, something like that, we were actually using primarily tents that we had sewn, right? And I would take the kids and I would go to places like San Rafael Swell for the weekend or somewhere in Utah backpacking, right? Um, so we ran those tents for quite a while ourselves. And then probably, I think it was 2011, I think that was our first sale early in 2011. I'd have to look to make sure, but I think that was early on, right? So in 2011, 2010, we put up a website. 2011, um, we got our first kind of sale, right? And it was really kind of funny because our first sale was, you know, it couldn't be something simple like someone down the road or someone in the near area. It was a person who lived at the end of the ice highway and their first, <laughs> yeah, up in the Northwest Territories. And they mm -hmm. were, they were a uh, Royal uh, Mounted Police, right? Or however it's referred to there, right? Um, they were a Mountie, right? So, and they were going to use it. Um, their first trip was a fly in trip across the Mackenzie River in the spring to hunt muskox. Right. So the stakes were pretty high on, on this first sale actually working the way he wanted it to. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so uh, that was kind of our start. And over time, um, things grew quite quickly. Um, you know, our, our sewing people, um, we found out while we were kind of going through this process. My wife did some of the prototypes. We had a lady around here who sewed really well. But it turned out there used to be a marmot factory in Grand Junction that the mm -hmm. brand marmot was started there. And there was a fair amount of marmot sewers there. And we used to joke that they were old marmot sewers. And you could take the term old in both ways as in former. And they also were a little older because, well, marmot was there in the 70s and 80s. But they had a good idea how to sew outdoor gear. So we kind of worked with them. We really focused on quality um, from the get-go and durability, um, but still being lightweight. Um, because like I said, our very first tent was a fly-in trip across the Mackenzie River in Northwest Territories. So the stakes were relatively high on that right off the bat. So that was kind of the genesis. Over time, we added some more products, um, maybe three, four years in we started our backpack line um, we also keep introducing new tents all the time our tents we've ten had a tendency to get smaller and smaller mm -hmm. in, in a lot of our tent designs and it's not really uh it's not necessarily a thing of that we're trying to move away from bigger tents or anything but we're trying to complement and we believe we can do a really good job with a lot of the smaller tents as well so so one of the things I'm interested in is how you went from making shelters for yourself to deciding that you wanted to go into business. So I guess let's start with what were you doing before you were doing this? I used to work from home. I was a security researcher. So I spent a lot of time on a computer, uh, unfortunately. And in fact, that might have been why I spent every waking hour I could. Uh, mm. get away outside mm -hmm. doing things mm -hmm. because I there wasn't it wasn't that I necessarily disliked the job of security research um, it was more that I disliked the environment I am sure absolutely, absolutely hated having my face in a computer screen all day um, so it was like soon as I was off work and the family was taken care of. I was out in the woods somewhere doing something, right? Um, so how did that go? Well, we made our own tent, right? And we started having kind of fun making our own tents, right? And we started saying, well, what if we try this? And what if we try this, right? Um, and then eventually we said, well, we feel that this is relatively unique and that we can provide a good uh, value proposition in it. Right. And we started under the premise that value wasn't necessarily price point. Um, that, mm -hmm. that value was much more about um, long term value. Right. Because, I mean, anyone, I don't want to say anyone can make stuff cheap, but you can make steep, cheap stuff that doesn't last. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so we really kind of took that other premise that our value is going to be holding up and lasting a long time. And as such, kind of funny, funny story. I recently was contacted about a customer to do a couple little repairs on their tent. Um, it was one of our first customers. He wasn't even in our current shopping cart software. And I think the last time I had communicated with him was in 2011. So I was, you know, uh, we've gotten back several tents that have been out there for years that some people have used 100, 150 days a year um, guiding and doing stuff like that. So they've held up and really stood the test of time. So, Yeah, and I think it's fascinating that you don't come from an engineering or a um, maybe a necessarily strictly a mathematical background. Some, I talked to a lot of designers who were from that world. Um, and they also like backpacking and that's kind of how they got into designing gear. So what is your process like? Did you have a big learning curve to learn kind of like the engineering side of all this? Well, actually, I would I would say that that, that isn't true. I mean, security research, um, computer security research has a lot of um, engineering involved in it, right? Okay. And, and before that, I was... Uh, head security engineer at a company for a few years. We were bought by another large company. Um, so I did have a background. I, I originally went to school for engineering. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I, I never finished because mm -hmm. my goal, first, there was two things. One, my goal was the, on the degree was to accomplish a certain thing. And I was already accomplishing it and designing some of my own, it, it was guitar amp stuff, designing some of that back in the nineties. Um, so I kind of switched to, I wanted to do more of an environmental engineering thing. Um, but I actually had life being a little too good. I would have had to transfer to a, another college and all that. And at that time I had my own business and, Quite frankly, I, I mean, I wasn't getting rich by any means, but I had a pretty good life where I could kind of call my own shots. If I wanted to go on a 30 mile bike ride, I could go on a 30 mile bike ride and do work mm -hmm. at night. So, mm -hmm. um, so I do have some of that in my background. So, okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense actually. Yeah. yeah so. Um, so what is the process of designing a piece of gear look like for you? So let's take a, well, since you started with tents, let's start, let's take a tent. So do you, are you out in the field and you have an idea and you, you come back and you try to execute that idea or is it driven by, um, consumer need or how does the genesis of an idea start for you? So we're really open on the genesis part right um so sometimes the genesis may be that i'm out backpacking or hunting or doing something and i'm kind of kind of like wow i really wish i had this right mm -hmm. so sometimes the genesis might be that i see something uh be it in one of our products or somewhere else and think you know that implementation could be used differently in a really cool way Right. Um, sometimes it comes from customers requesting, hey, you know, what I could really use is something like this. Right. So to take I'll kind of go through all of those Genesis. Right. Just in real quick examples, for instance, the courthouse tent, which is a lightweight wall tent styled tent. Um, you know, by lightweight, it's not something we're going to carry backpacking, but it was really kind of designed around more of like the, uh, it was actually designed initially for someone who llama packed and they had, they were a dentist and they had had a wall tent that they really liked. And they asked us if we would be interested to make something, um, similar to that and that they would totally pay us for our time. Hmm. Um, so that one started really as, as that kind of Genesis, right? It was a customer mm -hmm. who said, I have this tent I really like. It's not even in production. Um, so that was one, right? But then like last year, we we introduced two new tents that were both zipperless, um, which was 
the Silex and the Olus, right? Um, the genesis of that idea goes back years and years ago um, to another tent we had called the LBO. And the LBO has this kind of vestibule, um, I guess you'd say beak that is tensioned above a vestibule. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I kept thinking to myself, you know, I bet you could almost get some sort of closure running this if you did the geometry right. And I really kind of been playing with that idea in the back of my mind for, for years. And I had brought it up to a couple people um, that worked for us or worked closely with us. And they would be like, Oh, that's, that's not, that's not feasible. I don't, I don't think that'll work. Right. And finally, you know, I kept kind of revisiting it. Um, and I kept thinking, yeah, I think I can make that work. Um, so finally I drew it up and I kind of forced a set to get a production or to get a sample made into our, in with one of our seamstresses. Right. Um, and it came out and it was like, no, this is functional, right? This concept is functional. Now we need to work on it from there, right? And which was we needed to make the tensioning system more user-friendly because initially the tensioning system was basically a process concept, right, um, on, on the line. And so we did that. And even when we did that and we had a couple working samples, um, people were very much on the fence or not with it. Some people were like, that's awful idea. I love zippers, right? And then other people mm -hmm. were like, that's genius. No zipper, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, you know, I think time being relatively proven with it is it's been really well received. Um, and at outdoor shows, when most people see something like that, it even kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, flips their mind a little bit. They're like, wow, that is super cool. But it, it wasn't without um, struggle, one, thinking, wow, can we actually do this? Um, and then two, um, you know, the concept of it with people itself, even people inside of Seek Outside and outside of Seek Outside. In general, it was like the more adventurous um, Seek Outside people were like, that is awesome. And the people that were a little more into the bigger tents and base camp kind of stuff were like, oh, I like a zipper, right? So, but if we kind of go back, if we kind of take the application of how we've learned things over time, um, being a security researcher, right? Um, the basic thing with security research um, really is breaking and fixing things. I mean, if you really break it down, right? It's mm -hmm. it's breaking software or breaking processes and then fixing them. And almost always in that, the simpler, the better, because there's less things to fail, the more it's simplified. Um, so if you take that and we really kind of follow that same thought pattern on a lot of designs. So if you take a look at light tents, I mean, the number three zipper, to get tents real light is almost always the first place that they go, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially if you get into a sandy environment or some mud or dirt in it, right? Um, so those are almost always the repairable thing. So it was really about eliminating the weakness, right? Which in our mind was the number three zipper and then replacing it with something that was simple but effective and that users could self fix really if they needed to be. I mean, if you're hiking 2,500 miles with say a Silex and um, something chews through your cordage, it's really, there's no, there's no giant secret to it. Rethread some new cordage in the two and a half to three mil range in there and you're back up and functioning. It's not like a broken zipper where you have to go through some sort of convoluted process now to get your tent to stake out right until you can find someone to repair it. And the Silex is a DCF tent, right? It's available in both um, our nylon fabric and in Dyneema. So yeah, um, I personally have one in Dyneema and it is, in my opinion, it is sweet. and I, I love that thing. Did you guys have any kind of learning curve or... Um 
struggles to incorporate Dyneema fabric into your current patterns? Uh, yeah, it's, it's been an ongoing challenge. One, because the size of the fabric is a little different. Mm -hmm. Um, two, um, things like, you know, there's a little line every nine meters and things like that. So cutting it is a bit different. And then how you handle the fabric is a little different. And in, we had made some Dyneema shelters a few years ago and we had sized some shelters specifically because we wanted to start to offer them in Dyneema. Like we had a tent called the Beyond, it was shortened to BT2, but it really stood for Beyond Timberline 2. And it was a two person small teepee. And our initial intention with that was to offer it in Dyneema. And mm-hmm. I, had, I had a Dyneema version of it. But at the time, you know, after we got that tent out and stuff shortly thereafter, Dyneema, you know, when it was cubic tech was going to be sold. So we decided to kind of just sit on the fence and see how things developed over time. Right. So we sat that out for a couple of years. Um, Our growth and everything was really, really good. So it wasn't a uh, it wasn't something that we even worried about too much because we were having a hard time just keeping up with what we were making. Um, But then last year we circled back and we started saying, let's start to focus on lighter weight stuff. Now we took probably, we took probably about two years off from design and product introduction for the most part, other than just Mm -hmm. small inline changes or maybe a pack bag for the backpacks. Um, and we tried to focus on our instructions, our videos, all the stuff around to make the experience much better with those products. But then when we came back to it, we were like, okay, now let's focus on some lighter stuff. Um, so we've been in the last year really kind of in the lightweight design mode, I guess you would say, that is geared for more of the recreationalist than the hunter. And, you know, our, our surveys bear out that we're about a, about 70% of our customer base is hunting. Uh, about 30% is more high adventure recreational people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, not, not the two or three day backpack trip, but longer pack rafting, things like that, right? More remote stuff. Um, and that, that, that aligns pretty well with, with our product. Um, the challenge is it's, it's kind of challenging for us having such a diverse user group, right? Because we may get people that call in that are coming from a wall tent background, right? And they only sleep in the back country if they absolutely have to, or if mm-hmm. they think that it's going to make their elk hunt or whatever more enjoyable, right? And then we have people that spend 150 nights a year in the back country. Right. So they're kind of all over the board. And so the expectations when someone coming from a wall tent background calls and wants something to sleep to people, it's far different than when an ultralight backpacker calls and wants to sleep to people. Right. It's it's totally different. So do you have a general guiding principle or a design aesthetic that you try to bring to uh, the design process every time, or does it just depend on what your product and what your audience is? I would say um, we have a general guiding principle, which really goes back to as minimalist as possible that still performs, that we still would feel comfortable having out when weather turns nasty. Um so that is what I would say our general guiding principle is. We really try to be minimalist in our feature set, but that doesn't mean that we don't strategically place guy outs or make really robust tie outs um, to support support poor weather, right? And the same for apex of tents and stuff like that. I mean, I think if you someone looked at our silex, right? Which I think in Dyneema weighs like 11 ounces and it's 49 square feet and it's surprisingly roomy, right? I mean, a seven footer can sleep in it without any issue. Um, I think someone who is really used to 
the ultralighters would be like, wow, this thing's way overbuilt, right? But we're not we're not trying to build it for the person who heads to town if it gets windy or mm-hmm. if there's a few days of bad weather. We're trying to build it so people can stay out there, right? So it's a little bit different ethos on that. Well, let's talk about backpacks. I think it's interesting that you started out designing tents and then a couple of years in moved to backpacks. So first of all, what was the genesis of you saying, okay, we feel comfortable with tents. Now let's start designing something else. That's a can of worms. Uh, (laughs) So uh, primarily the genesis was based on those ideas coming from different, different areas. I had, I had some backpacks uh, that I used uh, primarily in the ultralight or lighter weight stuff. I used a couple of different ULA packs, right? Um, not going to lie there. Um, I had a couple old, I had an old nineties Osprey that I actually thought was a good performing pack and was much better than anything Osprey was building at the time. Um, I had a mystery ranch at one point I had, some externals and I cycled through a few packs but every time it came to hunting season I kept thinking to myself there's got to be a way than the better way than this seven or eight pound pack right um and so I had a external frame Jansport pack that was bought at a garage sale or thrift store or something like that the frame was even kind of bent but it was a relatively small external frame pack And every time when it would come around to hunting season, I would start being like, if I could get this thing to work, I could maybe have like a three to four pound pack that would carry the load really well. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would always, for whatever reason, start monkeying with it then. And then I would always monkey with trying to make my ULAs much stronger. I put a different frame in one of the ULAs and, put different stitching in it to support the frame and stuff. But there were still other areas where under a heavy load, stitching was problematic. Um, So that was kind of the starting point. But then I happened to meet Nathan, who was a customer of ours from the East. And he had bought a tent and he was freshly married and he was coming on his first Western elk hunt. And he had kind of, hit me up on some forum asking me, you know, a little bit of information about elk hunting, right? And I told him, hey, I can point you in the right direction towards some elk. Um, And there's usually elk in these areas. And it was an archery elk hunt, right? Um, So he came out, he came out with his buddy. Um, There were some issues, his buddy had to leave, family sickness. Um, Then his wife was super worried about him. So I backpacked in with him. you know, he had already been backpacked, but I backpacked and kind of calmed the fears of his wife. But he had he had went through a lot of different packs. I think he had owned like 40 or 50 different packs. And he was into a lot more of the high end kind of hunting packs, which there wasn't a lot of variety at that point. Um, and I said, well, you know, your packs, your stuff's probably going to get wet. And he's like, well, Colorado is dry. You know, rain's never a problem here. And I was like, well, I was like, you know, my experience has been if you spend five days contiguous in the back country, you're going to get rained on at some point, you know, um, mm-hmm. even if the weather forecast looks looks fine. And then he's like, well, I have the Z-Pax rain cover. I'll be fine. And I was like, well, my experience is those rain covers are not really don't really work that well because you're kind of reluctant to put it in your pack and all these things. Right. So anyway, he was out there for a few days and I went up, sued this basically checked on him for his wife, right? Um, who was worried about him. And then he found a good camp, got on some elk. And a few days later, he killed a really nice bull with his bow. You know, he, he was extremely, you know, for, for archery hunting, which typically has a 10% success rate of getting any elk to kill a 320 inch over the counter bull your first time uh, hunting elk is pretty impressive right and so the weather was really awful um i went and helped him pack out had a friend of mine helped him pack out and he found out that he really did not like his pack 
it gained a lot of water weight. Um, it was uncomfortable with a hundred plus pounds in the mountains and stuff like that. So he was determined to have a better pack experience. So he mm -hmm. went home to Tennessee and he started just buying all these packs and just turning, buying them on Craigslist or eBay, buying it, trying it, loading it up with a hundred pounds, trying it, buying it, trying it. Cause he was just so unhappy with what he had at the time, you know, um, and so we kind of communicated during this, right? Because he was kind of like, hey, if I if I find something that works that could be maybe lighter with carbon fiber or something, do you think you could get a carbon fiber frame made? And I was like, well, I can ask our suppliers and see. And finally, he had come to it with kind of the notion of that what he had was, what he had as a pack was the best kind of platform uh, i.e. dual stay, lumbar pad, whatever. Um, what he got done, what he came to the conclusion after a lot of that testing, and I don't know how many packs he cycled through, I think it was like 30 different packs, was that things like the hanging belt and stuff worked better for him. So after a bunch of discussion, you know, we said, you know, I think we can make a better backpack. Um, why don't we each just kick in a minimum, minimal amount and do a couple of prototypes and see. So that goes kind of into the guiding principles there that we kind of, we kind of took the premise of that all the other backpack designs were a failure at this point. You know, it was a, a failed concept. You needed a rain cover. You needed this, you know, maybe they were strong enough, but they certainly weren't comfortable and they weighed way too much. And they had a lot of features that you didn't need. So we started basically with that, that we were going to do a ground up backpack design and see where it ended up. Just letting testing and stuff be our guide. And so part of the guiding principles was, we decided that a frame needed to provide structure in certain areas, but that was all it needed to do. It didn't need to have, you know, fancy this or fancy that. It just needed to provide the structure that helped take the load off of your hips, right? And that the belt needed to stay tightly. Um, and even our belt design was fundamentally different. We weren't using, even though it was going back to kind of more of the hanging belt, um, and it was tailored, it was just a different design than what everyone else was doing. So we put our 500 bucks in, we made a couple mock-ups and we said, we think this kind of has legs. Um, so then he found someone where he could make a couple sample frames. And we literally went out in the woods with these duct together, duct tape together frames, right? We had our sewing shop make a couple belts, right? For us to put on them. Um, we literally went out with these duct taped together frames that had some padding duct taped and just, I mean, nothing, you know, if someone saw you walking down the trail, they'd be like, what? Um, mm -hmm. and we started doing a bunch of load testing and we started to be fans of it. And then from there we started to refine it and really refine our feature set, but the process part of it really started with our goals and our goals were like just a whiteboard thing of, we want it to be waterproof enough that you don't need a rain cover. We want it to be strong enough to support a hundred pounds. We wanted to have the most minimal frame that we think can provide the necessary structure for good performance. Um, the purpose, we went down into the purpose. The purpose of a belt is to hold it on your hips and not give you bruising. Um, the purpose of the harness um, is to allow you to shoulder it at the correct, correct torso length, so then you can use load lifters to bring the bring the load in as well as lift some of the weight off of your shoulders, so it's not all on your shoulders. So we we also at the big level we're like we want to we want to focus much more on fitting your body and contouring it than we do on trying to be rugged and stiff. Like at the time, let's take a mystery ranch style belt, but it was common in a lot of belts. They were basically the two wing designs underneath the lumbar pad. And a lot of times they would bridge the gap between the lumbar pad and 
those wings with some hard plastic behind them, right? With a stick mm-hmm. there. And a lot of times the belt was designed to have a six or seven inch load transfer for the frame to match your back and put the load into sitting on your lumbar. Instead, we spread that out to what is effect. The frame is 14, but what is effectively 12 and a half, which puts it much closer to your iliac crest and distributes it much more. And what we wanted to follow was the premise of, I take a belt and I put it on. Just say I take a webbing belt and I put it on a two inch webbing belt. I tension it moderately. You cannot pull that thing off my body because it form fits to it. So our our concept was much more that instead of to try brute stiffness and brute strength between the pieces. Um, and that just went all the way through the design. You know, um, we thought it needed to compress and control loads well. So we did the talon concept while focusing on keeping your main bag contents really dry. And so you didn't need a rain, rain cover, which further reduced weight, right? So that was really a genesis. It was, I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't an easy process. It wasn't not frustrating a lot of times it would have been way easier to start with someone else's design and say, oh, we're going to make carbon stays and use a little bit different foam and touch up a couple things and call it an improved pack and put a name on it. That would have been so much simpler than really starting ground up and trying to evaluate every component all the way through and and really trying to test it out as much as possible um, and let testing and overall design concepts be your guide. Yeah, I'm looking at the Uniweep and the Divide right now, and um, I think these are cool packs because this kind of gets into the overlap you were talking about between hunters and backpackers, and and these packs are of interest to our community for people who um, are maybe doing some desert travel and they have to have a lot of water with them, or they're doing a long time between resupplies. Um, so they're really attractive to ultralight backpackers who need, uh, comfortable load hauling capability. And I just, it's, it's fascinating that that originally sprung from a a hunting need. Yeah. And that's, yeah, to go back to the hunting and rec world, um, we've had people advise us several times to not try to fence it and serve both types. Um, Sometimes we probably get a little strong in our ideals and just follow our ideals. Um, But myself, I see that there's a lot of times there's been a general ugliness um, between the hunter and recreationalist worlds, right? Like um, the hunters a lot of times seem to think that the rec people are nothing but a bunch of vegan granola eating hippies that, don't want them to do anything. Um, and the rec world, a lot of times, hears that hunting season is near and all of a sudden everything is in full blaze orange and they're afraid of anyone that has a tiny bit of camel on in the woods. <laughs> um, we purposefully decided to try to serve both and to serve them with very similar gear offered in slightly different colors. Um, You know, we don't necessarily pander to one or the other because we believe that good gear is good gear, right? And quality gear, we're a backpacking company. I mean, even in the hunting world, if you go and take a look at the overall hunting world, I'm sure we have hunters from just about everything that um, purchase from us. But if you really take a look on the, if I was to define us, I would say, we are for backpack hunters, which, you know, which includes the activity of backpacking in it, right? So therefore, you know, the difference in need is not that difference. You know, the, the primary difference is we're not designing for just one season or two season use only. We're also trying to design when you might be at 11,000 feet in November right? In the Rockies Um, or in Alaska in the Brooks Range and a plane dropped you off for 10 days. You know, so we're trying to design for that. Uh, But I don't, I don't view it as that big of a difference. 
And personally, I'm, I'm actually really glad to see, I think, those trends to step back a little bit. I think while there's been that division between the rec and hunting crowd, I think a lot of it was almost purposeful. I think um, some of the companies on both ends try to vilify the the other as their way to uh, to dig into their customer base a little bit. It's not mm, a lot. Mm-hmm. It's not a lot different than what you see in politics, right? I mean, sometimes people just want to attract their hardcore base and divide people, right? And it's unfortunate, but uh, we believe more in the whole uniting part. So I think that it's really kind of went pretty well for us in that regard. And I'm glad to see things like a couple of years ago, Gear Junkie started handling more hunting content. Um, funny thing is, I mean, from what I heard is, you know, they're hunters themselves. They just didn't feel comfortable with the content and the readers. But I noticed that Philip from Section Hiker is starting to offer hunting content as well. And quite frankly, I mean, some of the hunting clothing brands are every bit as good as the premium uh, hunting brands in the rec world. Um, Sitka, I think, has done some amazing stuff. And sometimes I've had people question me if I'm out snowshoeing and camo. And I say, I actually believe this jacket is the best, most breathable um, high activity jacket there is. And it's a uh, the Sitka Kelvin Active, right? Um it's only available in camo. If it was available in a solid, I would buy it. So people wouldn't look at me weird snowshoeing in camo, Uh, (laughs) but, but it's the truth, you know? Um, And that's just one example, but I think hunting companies have done a pretty good job in, in, you know, and it hasn't always been that way. Let's, let's be clear. There's probably 20 years, 30 years where the, the, the people leading the industry were in the rec world. Right. But probably since 2010, there's been a lot of innovation going on in the hunting industry, you know, and some of the other brands, even though they're um, competitors of ours, I think have done really good jobs with what they've done, you know, in their gear. So, yeah, it's unfortunate that you could be outside snowshoeing in uh, a camo jacket and get funny looks. I think it really speaks to part of the problem that I think that the larger outdoor world has. And it seems to me like we're kind of at the point where we, we kind of need to put stuff like that aside because we're, we're all out, out there to enjoy the outdoors. And from a conservation standpoint, we really need to be kind of on the same page about things. I agree 100%. And part of that um, is for the conservation. As we know, there's been a lot of attacks on public lands, public places, um, some of my favorite places have been shrunk or rescinded. I love I love the Escalante area, right? Grand Staircase. Um, and so some we all have to be fighting the same fight on that if we're going to stand up because being divided, neither of us are big enough to really make much of an impact on it. And so I think that everyone's voice is needed. Um, and it, it is kind of a sadness, but like for, I live in relatively rural Western Colorado and I know that, I know that Western Colorado and these more rural crust of the Rocky mountain, that the people here aren't necessarily an average representation of what's in the rest of the continental U S but here there's a lot of people that cross over. I mean, um, uh, one of my, you know, some of my hunting buddies, I mean, one, one guy I chat with about hunting, you know, he would, he guided Denali at a minimum 17 times, you know, as, as a guy, you know, uh, another one owns a rescue, um, company, you know, and yeah, he goes out and rock climbs and mountain bikes and does all sorts of things. And then he also might call me and be like, well, I got a bull down and I'm in a kind of a tight spot. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so, I mean, but, but we do a lot of it. I think to a certain extent, a lot of it is locavore, uh, knowing where your meat comes from, um, not wanting to partake necessarily in a lot of the big industry shenanigans. Uh, I much prefer knowing that the elk or deer came from the local mountains. I feel much more comfortable with that. 
Uh, likewise, as I'm chatting to you, I'm smoking salmon from a salmon fishing trip in Alaska, right? So I try to take it down to fish, avoiding avoiding buying fish. And I know that that one's a little hard one, a little hard one to justify, but I saw some study where like 50% of salmon was mislabeled. Um, mm. It usually was labeled as something more pricey than it wasn't. And uh, how do I know that the salmon I have is really a Copper River Red or a Kenai salmon? Well, catch it myself, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, well, I want to wrap things up here in, in about ten or fifteen minutes. Maybe just by asking you some sort of larger macro style questions. So, as a designer and a small business owner, mm -hmm. what are you? What are you the most proud of? What has been your biggest success in the last ten years or so? I'm proud because, to my knowledge, we were the first ones to have that conversation of hunters and rec people aren't that different. Even though I've I've gotten a lot of flack, um, we we'll stand up for, we will always stand up for, you know, fair chase, public land, ethical hunting. We'll also always stand up for um, recreational backpackers stuff like that. If um, and so I think to see that and to also see how involved we've been in conservation over the years, we've been involved in backcountry hunters and anglers really since their very first Rondi, um, 2% for conservation. I've been to DC, um, advocating. I talk with some people on a, I wouldn't say super regular basis, but I talk to some influential people who are doing stuff around conserving public lands all the time. And that's their passion and they're really working on it. So I think more so than the product, um, if I was to choose a number two A or number two would be that we've pulled this off, that we have a lot of really good people working for us that I'm really fond of. We pay them a good living wage. We have a, I think, a great work culture. Uh, we've really put a lot of emphasis on that um, and everyone being able to communicate. There's no, there's no, I'm the boss and you're not sort of thing you know i mean i've i've worked with a couple different designers within so that we have then they're more into making these making sure they go through the whole design process but usually it starts with a sketch up or something from me but uh, i'll totally be like we we're not going to agree on everything you know if we're if we agree on everything we're not being honest with each other right but we're able to have really good discussions about disagreements and usually find the best way for products to go forward. So the converse of this question is what has been your biggest failure or something you wish that you had done differently? So we started under the premise of making and building good products and delivering them and basically screw everything else. Um, so we were really bad at marketing. Uh, we put very little effort on it. In fact, you can find threads on Backpacking Light of people complaining about how little, how poorly we marketed stuff, right? As far as taking photos, um, videos, explaining stuff all on, on the website, right? Uh, that and branding, we put really no, no effort into. We finally hired someone whose primary role was marketing probably three years ago, uh, marketing and branding. And over time that's grown. And like I said, we took really almost, a, I would say close to a two year gap in product release and design. And it was much more of a fo focus was going back and getting videos for our products, getting instructions, getting written instructions, getting all those things, you know, because we, we made some inception assumptions that um we learn everything online and it's all pretty easy but that's not the way we have to find different ways because everyone has to react to it right I, I hunted with someone one time on a trip um it was um and there was a bunch of guides and i was invited down there and there was a couple of other people from other outdoor companies and then there were some guided clients and it was a pretty good time um 
but like one of the guys was, did pretty well for himself. And one of the guys was like, oh yeah, he just orders equipment and has it shipped to me in Canada and then comes in and hunts. And so he was wanting one of our tents. And I was like, oh, we need to do a way better job on instructions if this is how, <laughs> you know, if mm-hmm. some, you know, because we, we made the assumption that people were going to buy it, set it up, learn it, you know, but no, some people have a, a sleeping bag shipped to their friend in British Columbia and, you know, take it out of the box and throw it in a backpack and fly in on a bush plane somewhere. And so we needed to do a far better job at that. So we've cleaned that up, I think, a lot over the years. But, you know, early on, we were probably brutally bad in that. <laughs> this is a related question. And if your answer is the same, that's fine. But, um, what advice would you give to maybe someone listening to this podcast who has an idea for a cool piece of gear and is thinking about turning it into a business? I would say really um, follow your passions on it. Uh, go for it. I mean, just don't go for it to the to the level that you can lose everything, right? Go for it in an educated, smart way. I love, I love seeing innovative ideas, um, even if they aren't my cup of tea, but I really appreciate people that think outside the box, um, because I think that that's lacking in a lot of ways. And I, I personally reward companies with my business. If I think that they're pushing the boundaries instead of playing it safe, I'll be, I'll be an early adopter if I have to, right. Uh, because it's kind of my little private reward for not staying with the status quo. Um, I think, you know, over time I have read a lot of books um, about managing people and or things that can get in the way, like um, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, that mm-hmm. was and Holiday. Book. Yep, Holiday. That was a good book. Um, And it does happen. I mean, some people think if they start working for us, all of a sudden they're a rock star, right? Um, You got to keep everyone to be humble, right? Stay humble. Um, Likewise, his other book on The Obstacle is the Way, I thought was a fantastic book. And I encourage people to be very outside the box in their thinking. Um, But, you know, another book I recently read was on the Lean Startup. And I think the Lean Startup, had some good ideas that I didn't know I was trying to implement when we did this. Um, but now that I, and I don't necessarily agree with everything there, but I take a lot of it and I'm like, okay, this is a little more formalized process for a lot of the things I was thinking. And so I, I might encourage someone to read a book like the lean startup or something, you know, don't, don't waste, uh, um, all your money bankrolling something that you don't really have a feeling for what people are looking for on it. I mean, I'll, I'll go back to problem problems we've done, right? Uh, earlier I talked about how our backpacks were fundamentally different in ground up build, right? However, our marketing was really horrible at conveying that and conveying the advantages to people and the bulk of people, when they first saw it, was like, it's an external frame pack. Um, you know, it doesn't look tough like I'm used to, or it doesn't look like this. You know, it was conceptually pretty far out there um, for a lot of users. I mean, thankfully, the BPL crowd um, is pretty pretty okay with trying out new concepts um, and pushing the envelope. Um, but the hunting crowd was kind of like, this is kind of like you're pulling up in a Ford Ranger telling me that I'll do the same work as an F-350. I just don't <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, it, it didn't check those boxes on what people thought. And so I wish I would have known that earlier. I mean, one thing on the pack specifically, well, Well, I think our packs are extremely compelling. Even the new flight is very compelling. Uh, I think that a lot of hunters didn't realize that weight mattered to them because they weren't the type that were 
going back five, 10 miles or having to gain 3000 feet to get into a spot, right? Once they, once they do that, they're like, Oh, lightweight. I see the benefit. <laughs> um, but you know, we missed the mark there and we maybe could have, maybe earlier we could have balanced our approach a little bit better to serve the two groups a little better. One with our more refined minimalist designs and then one that maybe looked a little more the part. One last question. So you're in the outdoor industry. What do you think is the biggest challenge for the outdoor industry right now? I think there's quite a few. Um, but I think it's having a place to play. You know, I mean, um, there's a combination of overuse, uh, but also a combination of not having people care and people trying to get rid of our public lands and stuff as well. Um, we have to have the places to play, um, outside of my passion for it. I mean, being heavily involved in conservation is very important to SO. That is our business. We're not making tents that people wear around town as lifestyle. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's not, uh, we're not making, you know, this isn't meant to criticize Patagonia or, or someone like that, but they can still do a fairly good amount of, say, lifestyle stuff, right? I mean, people aren't buying a tent to just go walk around town or buying one of our packs so they look cool, right, um, and identify with it. You know, they're buying them to go out somewhere, usually someplace wild and relatively remote. And on the flip side of that, Sometimes I think things are loved to death. You go to Jackson Hole or Yellowstone in the summer. And I mean, I, I hope they're about, I'm, I'm not an East Coaster or West Coaster. Um, I do know I went, tried to go to Yosemite maybe a few years ago. I, I hiked part of the JMT and my truck was broken down. So when my truck was back, I thought, oh yeah, I should check out. I'd, I drove in there and I turned right around. There was way too many people for my, uh, for my, uh, liking on it. I was like, eh, come back in the winter someday. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think there's some overuse as well. Right. Do you think that, um, gear companies or, 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 you know, for-profit companies that are working in this space, do you think that they have a ethical, mandate to educate and um uh, i don't want to use the word lobby but but try to move conservation um principles forward i ask because you know if you look at like uh if rei puts up a facebook post um about like a, a piece of legislation or something it gets pretty intense in the comments about some people saying like ah, uh, you know, just, I just want to buy stuff from you and other people saying, no, this is important. It's all connected. So where do you land on that? I land on that. It's important and connected. Um, we, we take, we've taken our share of criticism on that. I've mm -hmm. had people like we did a, um, we worked with Argali, on uh, and they're a hunting brand. Um, and they did a video, they were doing a series of videos called the last wild places. And they did a late season float trip hunt in the Frank church. Right. Um, and we worked with them a little bit on that. And, you know, I got, I have some very critical email um, on both sides of it uh, of that. We shouldn't support um, stuff. You know, all they want to do is buy gear. Um, we also had, people complain to us like the Frank is my spot. How could you <laughs> work with somebody who publicizes something in the Frank? Um, and you know, it, it's, it's a business interest of ours. I mean, if everything gets sold up and, you know, people aren't going outside doing stuff, you know, we don't really have much of a business. So I think at that level, we have to. Are you the kind of person who can let those kind of critical emails um, sort of bounce off of you? Or, or do you have to work hard to let stuff like that go? Um, I can let them bounce off them. I usually send people a response, 
right? Um, when we get things that are critical of that nature. And we do that kind of stuff as a brand, even, even with people that say in our yearly, yearly survey, when people give us a bad rating of their experience, which is very seldom, we've typically gone through, it turns out half the time they've had, they hit the wrong button, you know, as we try to figure out what went wrong in the service or shipping or product expectation, right? Um, but I think you have to let it bounce off of you. I mean, when you, when you become, when you expose yourself to being more of a public figure, you're going to get criticized. It's just going to happen. You know, no one's going to be 100% happy with what you do. Um, and in my case, I usually kind of let the big overall picture guide me. And if it's follow, if I'm following those big overall beliefs and I can clearly articulate my whys, then I don't feel bad about it. I mean, yeah, people aren't going to agree with me all the time. I mean, there's people that don't agree with our products. I mean, we get people that say, well, your product would be perfect if you did this. And, but you know, there's always going to be people there's, it's a little bit of the Goldilocks syndrome that we call, right? I mean, it just happens, you know, it's, you know, someone would want a pocket on a jacket sewn at an angle versus someone else wants it flat. Well, Kevin, I super appreciate your time. Is is there anything that you wanted to talk about or that you wanted to say that you haven't gotten a chance to say yet? No, not really. I, I enjoy having these kinds of discussions. I'm active on BPL, um, although I wouldn't say I'm more active in just a brand way. Um, so if people have questions, by by all means, feel free to reach out um, and ask me. I usually try to respond to the best of my ability. Um, and it goes everything, even with design, like the flight pack, for example, it was, it was funny. Um, I think some people were trying to look because most of our products, if you look that we've released, most of them have something that we do different, right? That is mm -hmm. different than what everyone else is approach. For instance, zipperless, right? Um, and they're trying to, and it was like, there is really no, there's really no secret sauce in the flight. Um, we just tried to make a really good pack. Um, you know, it was kind of, I, I hate to make it sound anticlimactic, you know, <laughs> but it was, it was like, we didn't, we didn't have an aha moment in, mm -hmm. in, in here. You know, we just tried to take the feel of our bigger packs and save you eight to 16 ounces in a smaller platform. Kevin, thanks again. We really appreciate it. Where can people find you online? Seekoutside.com. Um, Facebook, Seek Outside, Instagram, Seek Outside, YouTube, it's Seek Outside Gear. Um, if people want to PM me or email me um, in Backpacking Light, that's fine too. I don't always check the PMs and stuff that often, but I'll get back to you. All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, we really enjoyed talking to you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Backpacking Light Podcast. The Backpacking Light Podcast is supported by BackpackingLight.com membership fees. A BackpackingLight.com membership gives you access to nearly 20 years of article archives, community forums, online education, and so much more. You can join our community right now at BackpackingLight.com slash subscribe. You can download the show notes for this episode at BackpackingLight.com slash podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. It helps other people find the show. Thanks for listening to the Backpacking Light Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And if we could leave you with one parting message, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. Happy trails, everybody. So I showed my backpack, walk away from my